First up after lunch is Matt Lawrence, and Matt's an insurance defense lawyer in Valdosta. He's been practicing law throughout the South for almost 24 years, and I understand a lot of his work's been in prescribed burning uh, for land with landowners. You're up, Matt. Take it away. Good morning, or actually good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be with you. Um, so, you have heard five presentations this morning already on uh, prescribed burning and how to do it. And you're now itching to get out there and strike some matches. But before you do that, let's talk about how to do that and stay in compliance with Georgia law. Um, as Frank said, I'm uh, a lawyer down in Valdosta. I've been practicing down here for about 24 years. And um, before, I guess my involvement prescribed burning started as a small child when my grandfather would carry me out to our farm and hand me a box of kitchen matches and tell me to go from one point to another point yonder and, and strike fires all the way. And for a eight year old child who was probably had pyromaniac tendencies, uh, that's about as good a deal as you could get. So I, it's kind of neat that uh, my these interests have coincided. And um, we will talk now about prescribed fire in Georgia, liability of a landowner. So in other words, how do we protect ourselves when we engage in using prescribed fire. So uh, first, let me give you my sort of obligatory statement that this is not legal advice, it's general information only. If you've got a specific question, you need to talk to a lawyer uh, of your own choosing. So having gotten that out of the way, what we're gonna do in the next few minutes is answer hopefully three questions. What is the Georgia Prescribed Burning Act? Why is there a Georgia Prescribed Burning Act? And most importantly, how do I comply with the Georgia Prescribed Burning Act? Well, the first, uh, what it is, is part of, it's part of the Conservation and Natural Resources section of the Georgia Code. Um, it is a subpart of the forest resources chapter, which includes the, 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 the statutory authority for the existence of the Forestry Commission and its duties. It also includes the Forest Fire Protection Act. And the reason that I mentioned this is because it, what you're gonna see in a few minutes is the legislature, the General Assembly in Georgia, realized how significant an impact forestry and forest resources have in the state of Georgia. And as prescribed fire has over the decades become re-recognized as an important tool in forest management, not just for timber and, and things like that, but also for game management, uh, wildflowers, the natural flora and fauna that you find in the historic southeastern uh, range of longleaf pines, the, the legislature, the General Assembly realized that it was important to do it and they want to encourage landowners to do it. And to do that, they enacted the Prescribed Burning Act to give landowners and prescribed fire practitioners some protection um, in the event that something goes wrong. And there are, the Prescribed Burning Act itself is, is somewhat unique. It's not the only one, but generally the legislature does not include its legislative purposes in a statute. But in the Prescribed Burning Act, there's a section of it that specifically says why the legislature, why the General Assembly passed this act. And some of those reasons I've got highlighted here. Uh, and it, as you can see, it says one of them is to promote the continued use of prescribed burning 
for community protection, silvicultural, environmental, and wildlife management purposes. And then they recognize that prescribed fire benefits uh, animals, plants, um, and uh, they wanted to, they want, they want that to be encouraged. They want us to have healthy forests and healthy forest areas, healthy natural areas. And they also recognize that when you, when you burn forest land, it reduces the risk of wildfire, basically is one of the, is one of the main things. And um, it, is, it helps control insect disease, um, et cetera. So the General Assembly set this thing up so that people would not be afraid of doing it and would have some protection if they did it. So how does that, let's look at how that uh, applies. Now, before we dig into the actual, the actual act, prescribed fire act itself, let me just make a couple of first of observations. There is no question that you may not burn anything during burn bans. Don't try it. Don't, don't uh, say, well, I'll just, you know, uh, I'll, I'll burn this trash pile, et cetera. If you burn while the director of the Forestry Commission has issued a burn ban and you get caught, you are guilty of a misdemeanor and, and can be prosecuted for that. Uh, and it won't be long, I'm sure, before the Forestry Commission starts issuing the summer burn bans. Um, Typically, I've noticed that North Georgia gets some more and has them for longer than we do here in South Georgia, but obviously that's de dependent on the weather. So, number one, don't burn during burn bans. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Next thing is, regardless of what you're burning, you need to get a burn permit. Now I've got, I have up here, it says you must get a burn permit. That's not exactly right, but I think it's always the best practice to do so. For example, if you are a farmer and you are simply burning off, like say you had, you had a, a field of, of winter wheat and you're just burning up the stalks, you do not have to get a burn permit to do that, but you do have to call your forest ranger unit in your county and tell them when and where you are going to do it. Um, I, you know, people people do that; they don't get it. They just call in and and, and say. But if you're going to call in, it takes two more seconds to get the burn permit. You might as well do it, and that way you're documenting um, what you were intending to do. So. Don't burn during burn bans. Do get a burn permit. And then now let's look at how the Prescribed Fire Act needs to be complied with. All right. As I said earlier, the General Assembly has emphasized that prescribed burning is a resource protection and land management tool that has safety benefits. It benefits our forest resources in Georgia. It benefits the environment and certainly benefits the economy of the state. You want to comply with what the requirements are. And there are basically um, two things that you must do. And then you can say there's a, th a, a third thing that you must not do. So the first thing, two things that you must do to qualify for the immunity from liability that is provided by the, 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 burn, the Prescribed Burn Act is to, when you are conducting your prescribed fire, you must have someone with previous prescribed burning experience or training to be in charge of your fire and to be on site until the fire is adequately confined um, or, or out or something like that. Um, and that can be someone who has gone through the Forestry Service, Forestry Commission uh, training program. I've done it. 
Uh, it takes a couple of days, but it's worth, it's very worthwhile and worth, you learn a lot of good information. Um, or they just have experience, um, such as a client that I'm representing right now in a case that's arose from a fire in Brantley County. Uh, he's a 79 year old man, 77 year old man. He's been doing it all his life. He was doing it with his grandfather and his father. And so he knows what to do. Um, but he didn't have any formal training. And then the second thing is something that I've already told you, get a burn permit. You've got to have that burn permit. So to have a prescribed, a burn, a prescribed fire that comes within the prescribed fire statute, you have to have someone on site who's in charge of your fire that has previous experience and or or training in prescribed fire and you have to have your permit. Now why do you want to do this? Well because the benefit is found here. If you have those two things, the person with experience or training and the burn permit, then you will be given immunity for damages, um, basically is what it says. It, this part says no pro property owner or owner's agent conducting an authorized prescribed burn under this part shall be liable for damages or injury caused by fire or resulting smoke. And so what that means is it doesn't mean you won't be sued. You can be sued if something goes wrong, but your lawyer who's representing you will be able to raise this immunity in the prescribed fire act as a defense, a complete defense to any liability that may be imposed upon you for damages. That is, unless, and here's the third thing, what you don't do, um, you cannot be grossly negligent in your starting of the fire, controlling the fire, or completing the fire. So to qualify for the immunity under the prescribed fire statute, you have to have someone with training or experience in charge, you have to have your, burning, your burn permit, and you or that person cannot be grossly negligent in the way that you conduct the fire. Now the question then is, what is a, what's gross negligence? Well, here's the, the statutory definition of it. And you can, you can make sense of that if you can. The, 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 the basically the South Georgia way of putting it is, if you've got walking around sense and you exercise it, then you weren't grossly negligent. Uh, for example, if you're going to, um, you're going to, you decide you want to burn a tract of woods or something like that, and it hadn't rained in a hundred days, and everything is dry as, a, as it can possibly be, and you figure, well, those fire breaks I cut five years ago are good enough, and you don't go and refresh your fire breaks, and you don't have any plan on um, how you're going to do conduct the fire, um, then that is probably grossly negligent. That's just not good common sense. You don't burn under those circumstances. You don't go out and just start a fire without making any preparation, making any plan um, on how you are going to do this with, with care. So that's, that's the standard. So as, as long as you are not grossly negligent, uh, or the other way of putting it is you are slightly diligent, uh, then you would qualify for the person who's working for you, uh, that you would qualify for, um, for qual the, the immunity that's given to you under the statute. So <clears throat> as I, as I've said, you know, the, the, the act clearly requires these, these first three things. You got to have a burn person with burn experience, the burn permit, and don't be grossly negligent. Now, let's talk about what happens 
how, or I'll put it this way. Let's talk about how you could help me or some lawyer who had to represent you if you got sued for a fire that caused some damages. How do you help us make sure that you have that immunity? Um, well, you go beyond what these three things that the law requires are. Um, and, and these are not things that the law requires. These are things that it's my suggestion that you, that you do so that you can easily show that you were not grossly negligent. Um, and first, we've already discussed this earlier this morning, is, is have a written burn plan. And the benefit of doing that is because you have a document in front of you that is going to show where you have thought out what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, where you're gonna do it, and under what conditions you're gonna do it. And you've got, if you use the form that the Forestry Commission provides, it's got a place for your desired range of weather conditions, and then it's got a place where you can put, you can look at the forecast for that day and get put down your actual weather conditions. Uh, because what has to be remembered, and, and, and everybody knows this, but I'm going, I'm going to say it, is that you know, once you've lit the fire and it gets going, there's not going to be, I mean, it, it's going to be to some extent beyond your control. The weather can change unexpectedly and, and bad things happen. Something that should have been, been simple and routine can turn into a, 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 a fire that burns hundreds of acres. So if you've got that written burn plan, you can show that that goes a long way in showing that you were not, um, that you were not negligent. And one th there was a question to an earlier presenter about whether the fire or the smoke plotting printouts and all are considered by the Forestry Commission to be legal documents. I can't answer that for the Forestry Commission, but I can say that under Georgia law, no, they're not required. It's not anything that uh, you have to do to have to print out those and save them. But it helps. I mean, it's, it's not any problem to print that out and attach it to your burn plan. It's not any problem at all to print off the weather forecast from the fire weather page on the Forestry Commission so that you've, you, you, you're documenting the steps that you took to show that what you did was not grossly negligent, that in fact you were, you were going beyond what the law requires you to do so that you will not be held liable for the damages that could come, come about. Number two, uh, have enough help. Um, make sure that you've got enough pe people who can help you uh, check and spot on the area that you're burning, put out, uh, flare-ups, put out stobs that are burning after the after you're finished, things like that. Number three, this is easy enough to do um, when you call the Forestry Commission to get the burn permit. What do they do? You know, the last one of the last things the, the operator tells you is what the weather conditions are, where the um, the the mixing height and wind speed and um, the wind direction of the things that come to my mind that they say. Uh, so you've got that, and I think you, I think the law allows you to rely on that. But it at, there's absolutely no reason why you can't have in in the today's environment of cell of smartphones get you a weather bug app, uh, weather underground app, the weather channel app, and just check those um, those weather forecasts before you get started. Uh, it, it won't take you but a minute to do it, and you can. That's another step that you can show. Here is what I did before we started this fire to make sure that we were doing this properly and as safely as possible. A fourth thing that you can do is go take the Forestry Commission. Uh, training course on, and get, get certified. 
Uh, it only takes a couple of days to do it. As I said earlier, you learn a lot of fascinating, particularly about weather, at least in my, in my case when I took it, um, it, it uh, weather information. Um, and again, that if you do that, then you've already met your uh, part number part one of having someone with with experience and or training be on site because that'll be you. You can you you've met that that element uh, in the in the statute. Next, these the, the next couple of things are I think it's just kind of common courtesy type issues. Depending on where you live, um, you go and tell your neighbors that you're planning to conduct a prescribed fire. And in some places, like where I live outside of Hayhara, uh, that, that's not a problem. Nobody, most everybody around where my, my farm burns and they're used to it. They know what's going on. But if you've got some neighbors that may not have been around a, a, as long as you have and, and aren't aware of it, go and, and just tell them what you're doing, you know, when you plan to do it, and take that opportunity to explain why you're doing it and be able to tell them, hey, and, and to, you know, to, to be as safe as we can, here's what I've done. I, I, we have cut fire breaks um, and we've made sure there's no debris on them. We have cut the, the, the tract that we intend to burn into small, manageable um, burn blocks. We're going to have several people out here. We got a tractor with a 400 gallon water tank on the back that we can use to put things out if we need to. And, uh, and you know, invite them to come watch or come help. Uh, that certainly would go a long way in in showing that you've gone beyond what the what the what the law requires. And then a couple of other things, you know. And I said I've got here on number seven. If you think anything might, bad might happen, call State Patrol, Forest Commission, DOT, and put them on notice. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, if you, if you see something's about to get ahead of you, uh, then you need to call all three of those and tell them, look, we, we, got a, we may have a problem here. There may be smoke that hits the highway, something like that. Go ahead and put them on notice. Um, in fact, I've got the fire number or the phone number rather for our local forester in my cell phone as it is anyway. Um, so, you know, have those numbers handy and be able to get to them if you need to. And then the other thing, the final thing is, and this sort of ties in with what I said on, on point one about the written burn plan, document what you've, what you've done. And that doesn't necessarily just mean written documents or papers, but if you've, if you've cut fire breaks, Take pictures of them on the morning that you start to, um, to, to, before you start the fire to show that you uh, had it done, that they were clean. There was no reason to think that a fire was going to jump across them or anything like that. Uh, before you start, start a small fire uh, just, to, just to test the wind, just to confirm that what the wind conditions are where you are are consistent with what the forecasts that you have uh, obtained. And if they're not, then you might want to rethink what you're doing. Um, so you, you just want to be able to show what you've done. So here's where this comes important. Let's, let's say that you do, you start a fire <laughs> and um, smoke, the wind shifts unexpectedly and smoke goes and hits a highway and there's a smoke bank that people run into and whenever they run into fog or smoke, what's the first thing they do? They slam on their brakes and then they get rear-ended from, from behind and of course bad things can happen under those circumstances. 
and you get sued and the lawyer who has sued you is across the table from you taking question, asking questions of you under a, in a deposition under oath and he or she wants you to tell him everything you did before you lit that fire. That's where all this stuff that I'm talking about becomes vitally important. You want to be able to say, well, first I did this. For first or sec first I, I cut fire breaks. Second, I subdivided the, the track into, into smaller burn blocks. Third, I went and told the neighbors that uh, sometime in the next two or three days, depending on the weather, we were gonna be conducting this burn. I prepared a written burn plan with you know, my, my steps in conducting, the, in conducting the fire. I had five or six friends out there helping me do this and, and, and to, to watch over things. I um, uh, checked, I, I got the burn permit the morning of the, of the fire. I, ch I checked the weather again uh, on the weather apps. And then before we really lit the fire, I, I started a small one just to confirm that the wind was blowing and the weather conditions were what we expected them to be and what we planned for them to be. And if you've done all those things, it's going to be very easy for your defense lawyer or a lawyer like me to file a motion on your behalf, basically asking the judge to throw out the suit because you're immune from getting any damages. Um, one of the reasons I think that I would say an additional benefit for getting certified is, is because then you've got the added element of being able to say, I've taken the certification, I've learned what to expect in these weather conditions, I know what kind of weather to look for, and here's the training that I, or the, 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 the way and the reason that I applied the fire in the way that I did it. In several of the cases that I, well, in all the cases that I've handled uh, defending landowners, usually farmers, in cases arising out of a, of a fire, they don't have, they did not have the certification. All, you know, it's all sort of the same story. They started doing as a small child with their dad and their uncle and their grandfather and kind of were trained by doing that. But it's a, but they're not always real good about articulating exactly what they did and why they did it. And that's what you want to be able to do. I mean, people make mistakes, um, certainly. And, you know, in, in dealing with something like the the weather two minutes you know it's got how much two minutes okay it's going to change and you got to be uh you got to understand that so that's you know kind of pr pretty much the summary of what i wanted to to talk to you about i'll be glad to take some questions for those of you who paid attention in your sunday school classes you'll remember that after the flood god said he wasn't going to destroy the earth by, uh, by water again, and then Second Peter tells us that he says he's gonna do it by fire. Just make sure your fire isn't the one that, uh, that starts that all off. So thank you all for uh, letting me be here, and if I got time for questions, I'll be glad to answer what I can. Thanks, Matt, really appreciate it. Glad you're part of this community. Um, we do have a number of questions. Can you guys see me? I can. Okay, cool. Uh, probably not time for all of them. So quickly one, and I'll let you maybe email people the rest. Uh, yeah, that's fine. If someone puts a prescribed fire head sign on the road to alert people that there might be smoke or something, is that putting increased risk liability wise on that? Burn? <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. And I don't know that I've got a good answer for it. Um, that's not that is not something that's required to do um and in some it's just kind of a case-by-case -case situation um if there's really no risk of that happening 
what I think the problem is, is that if you put it up there and somebody comes around a bend and all of a sudden just slams on their brakes and they get rear-ended when there's no reason for there to be a sign, then I think there, it increases the, the risk of liability. Um, but, you know, usually that's what the, you know, the DOT is going to, or the state patrol, they, they're going to do if you call them and say, look, I, I'm about to have some, some smoke over, over, over a highway, they'll get out there and do that. <coughs> Um, we appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Matt.